Hey, what is up everyone? Welcome back to another video. In this video, we're gonna dive into a new room on Trihackme called Pirat. At least I believe I'm saying that right. Pirat is an easy rated room on Trihackme, but teaches some unique concepts and requires some Python scripting. So I wanted to work through this room together. I'll do my best to explain everything that we are doing. And this really is a beginner friendly room. Now, some of the Python scripting might be a little difficult, but I think once you see us put the script together, uh, it'll make a lot of sense to you. So even if you're brand new to coding, brand new to scripting, I don't believe this room is out of your reach. Like we will go through this, we will learn this together. This is a free room. So even without a Try Hack Me subscription, you can do this, so you have no excuse. So if you're watching me live, I dropped the link to this room just a little bit ago in the chat, but if you're watching this after the fact on YouTube, hey, go ahead and pull up this room, start the machine, and then do everything right alongside of me. One of the best ways you can learn isn't just watching my videos with me, but as if we're sitting down together and we're working through this together. And also, if you do have questions about anything that I'm doing, either watching live, let me know in the comments or in the chat. And if you have questions after the fact, you're watching the standalone video, hey, let me know in the YouTube comments. Believe it or not, I try to read every single comment on my YouTube channel and do my best to also respond to them. So if you have questions, drop them in the comments and I will do my best to get back to you. But without any further ado, let me share my screen. Here we are on the main Try Hack Me platform. And as of today, the newest room is this Pi Rat room right here. So we will click that room. And I already started the machine just so we don't have to wait for it to boot up but that's the only thing I've done. You can see this is a free room, so anyone can deploy a virtual machine in the room, which means you don't need a Try Hack Me subscription to do this. Go ahead and get Kali booted up, get your black hoodie on, your Kali booted up, and uh, boot on the machine. But the first thing that we are gonna do is grab our IP address right here. We will open up our terminal. I'm gonna go over to Tyler Try Hack Me. We'll make a directory called Pyrat, drop into Pyrat, see if we can ping our IP, and we can. And what I like to do is right away add the IP to what's called the Etsy host file on Linux. This is how your Linux machine knows how to resolve an IP address to a host name. So if you think about like a cell phone, when you call your friend John, you don't have to type in John's number, you just type in his name and the phone book on your phone resolves John's name to his phone number. Well, that's the same thing that Etsy host does in Linux. So we can go ahead and do that. We'll do sudo nano Etsy host. Nano is just a simple text editor in Linux. You could also use Vim if you would like. I use both back and forth, and we will paste in our IP. I'll hit the tab key to jump over to here, and this is pirate.thm. We'll do control X in order to save it, type Y and click enter. Now, if we go ahead and ping pirate.thm, we are good to go. So step number one, add Pyrat over to your Etsy host file so we don't have to remember the IP and we can just refer to it by pyrat.thm. Now, if we look over at this room, there's definitely some interesting things here. So let's read through this and see if we can understand what is going on. It says Pyrat receives a curious response from an HTTP server, which leads to a potential Python code execution vulnerability. With a cleverly crafted payload, it is possible to gain a shell on the machine. Delving into the directories, the author uncovers a well-known folder that provides a user with access to credentials. A subsequent exploration yields valuable insights into the application's older version. Exploring possible endpoints using a custom script, the user can discover a special endpoint and ingeniously expand their exploration by fuzzing passwords. The script unveils a password, ultimately granting access to the root. So we have a very verbose description here. One thing that's gonna be helpful is for us just to break this down. So let's pull up our notes right here and we'll say, hey, here is our scenario. And I meant to paste that in that text box. I don't know why I didn't paste it in the text box. We'll change this over to plain text. And we'll also wanna turn on word wrap real quick, wrap code. So let's see if we can break this down a little bit. So number one, based on this description, there is gonna be Python code execution. So that's pretty clear. Somewhere we're gonna find this on the machine, Python code execution that leads over to a reverse shell. We can see that right here. With the cleverly crafted payload, it's possible to gain a shell on the machine. And now it says, delve into the directory, we uncover a well-known folder that provides a user with access to credentials. So with access, so we'll say post exploitation, we need to uncover credentials in a directory. That's kind of a hint that it's giving us. A subsequent exploration is available insights into the application's older version. So then we need to enumerate an older version of the application. We don't know what that application is yet. 
exploring possible end types using a custom script. So we're going to have to create a custom script. We can discover a special endpoint. So create a custom script, discover an endpoint, and expand their exploration by fuzzing passwords. Fuzz passwords. So based at least on the room description, if we slow down, I know it's very verbose, but if we just slow it down and look at the room description, we're given a lot of hints and kind of given a snapshot of some of the things to expect as we work our way through this room. So let's go ahead and give this a shot. We'll just make a header called enumeration and we will begin with our enumeration. One of the first things we can do is just run a simple port scan. Did I ever, okay, I did install Rust scan on here. Beautiful. Rust scan is a tool we can use. We'll do dash A to pass it our host, which is pirate thm and then we want to pass any open ports over to nmap and we'll run a dash a command on that now i'll explain what's going on here rust scan is just a port scanning tool you could just use nmap for this rust scan is really just up to preference i just find it easier and i don't have to use as much flags for nmap and with rust scan is really easy to use we just do dash a and then we pass it our target in this instance is pirate.thm you could also you could also just plug in the ip right here then what it's going to do is going to scan pirate.thm and find all open ports and then it's going to say hey whatever open ports that are open then we're going to run an nmap scan on it with the dash capital a flag with nmap you can actually see the the command that it's running down there, dash capital A just means essentially throw all of the enumeration scripts at every port that is running. See what is running on, for example, what's running on port 22, it's gonna be SSH, but try to do ban banner grabbing. See if we can get, figure out version information on SSH. We have 8,000 here based on the room description that's like the web server. And so same thing, do a bunch of enumeration on this web server and see what we are able to find. In the meantime, we can do some basic enumeration ourselves on this web server. Muhammad said, what is the endpoint, sir? Our endpoint is to get root based on the room. So we have to compromise this machine, get the user flag, and eventually get root access to the machine. So a classic boot to root machine that requires some custom scripting. So I think it will be a lot of fun for us to work through this together. But let's go ahead and see what is running on port 8000. We know this is gonna be SSH because that's a standard port for 22, and 8000 is often an alternative port for HTTP. So this is some type of web server. And if we look at the description, we can tell that, hey, there is a web server, it tells us right there from an HTTP server. Hey, what up, Kimberly can fix it. Welcome to the party, pal. Hey, thank you for stopping by and saying hello. Good, uh, good to have you here. But let's check that out. We can just rename this to Rust Scan. We'll open up a new terminal. I'm going to name this to just Terminal because I like to keep my stuff organized. And we can do a simple curl request on that port. So pirate.thm port 8000-v for verbose so we can see what it's doing. And it just tells us to try a more basic connection. I bet it also says it in the web browser. So we can just go ahead and check that if we go to HTTP pirate.thm 8000 try a more basic connection now there's a few things we could try but one of the most basic connections you can do is a netcat connection netcat just is going to send a packet to the server and the port and see if anything responds so you can actually use that for banner grabbing so for example we have is this done yet no it's taking a little bit we have port 22 right here we could actually do a netcat connection to that to see if we can do some banner grabbing on the ssh version and super easy we do netcat and we'll do pirate.thm and we can hit port 22 click enter and you can see that we have some banner grabbing so netcat is useful for that so netcat tells us at least on port 22 we have open ssh 8.2 running as well as the operating system of the host machine which is ubuntu so if we did not know that that is some helpful information that we are able to get which is also why if you are running a server you don't want ssh exposed publicly because an attacker can get this kind of information out of your web server we got read as well team sc what is up, y'all? We got we got the whole Team SC party. Yeah, watch out for that flaming donkey APT. Scary, scary uh, APT there, the flaming donkey. But it says try a more basic connection. So instead of 22, let's try to hit that connection on 8,000. Doesn't seem to do anything. We'll hit enter. We can say like, um, please subscribe. And it says invalid syntax line one. Now, if you know Python, this is actually a Python error. Can I import a library? And I can. So it seems that based on the room description, uh, 
in our notes that we took, we said there's going to be Python code execution that leads to a reverse shell. And it seems as if if we interact with this pyret.thm service on port 8000, it's literally just running Python. Now we can look at our Rust scan results. Is there anything interesting here? And no, it just kind of freaked out. Um, but we can see this. We have a simple HTTP on Python. So that just means I ran the Python-m module for HTTP on that port. So quite, quite interesting, definitely unique. We can go ahead and just grab this and add it to our notes so we have the scan result. So let's do that. We'll change this over to bash. And there we go. We have our scan results right there. And we can also begin to try to get some type of code execution on here. Now, if we jump back over to this, we can close that out. We'll just start again. And we can see if we can find some Python reverse shells. So reverse shell cheat sheet works for me. We'll go down to Python like so. And we can just try one of these. So we don't need the Python dash C command because it's already running Python. We just want to actually copy the Python code itself, which is right here. We will copy that, open up a handy dandy notepad paste that in there. And a few things we need to update. We want to update the IP so it matches our IP up there. Yours is going to be different than mine if you're following along. So we'll change this to 10.13.46.224 like so. And 13.37 because that's what a real hacker would use for the port. The rest of that looks good. And let's give that a shot. So we'll open up a new tab. We'll set up a netcat listener on port 1337. And now we have this netcat command right here. Let's just see if we can get code execution on there. And we were able to. So we have a shell as www data. So we'll just call this our shell. We can do ID pseudo dash L, just some basic enumeration. We don't know the password, so we can't check for pseudo privileges. It's going to air out three times. What am I taking notes on? I'm using Notion for taking notes. I don't have that set. I could give us a stable shell, but I'm not going to because I always forget the syntax. So whatever. I am apparently can't even look at this directory. We're in the root directory, so that's odd. This pyrat python module is actually running from root, but we get a shell as www data, and we can't do anything because we, of course, don't have root privileges. Let's go back out to the file root. We do lsla. If we go over to home, what users are we working with? We have think, and we can't go over to think. We're not able to access that. So we need to find uh, some credentials. Now there's a few different things we can do. We can experiment with. Let's pull this up. And if we do just like Linux credential hunting, there's often some really basic scripts we can run that might find something, might not find something. We could try, what's this going to show us? Hunting for interesting strings inside of files. So this is just grepping for strings and is printing out the color, sending all of our errors at dev slash null. And it produces a ridiculous amount of results because it's going from the root. We can just try this because uh, YOLO. <laughs> Let's see what happens. Let's see how bad this looks. It's going to find password in a bunch of different places. As you can see, this... Uh, Yeah, this is this is not going to be helpful to us, I don't think. We're just going to stop that. Although if I stop this, I think it's going to kill my shell. Yep, I figured it would. That's fine. We can get the shell back really easily just by rerunning our command. All right, shell is back, and we learned a lesson. Don't do that. Now, we can also run something called linps. Linps will check for common Linux privilege escalation. It will also search for different uh, places for credentials. So we can go ahead and do that as well. We'll open up a new tab so we're on our host machine. I'm going to call this our web server. And if I locate linps.sh, let's see if it's on this machine. And it's not on my VM, so we need to go ahead and download it. So if we just type linps uh, GitHub. 
here it is and I believe we can go ahead and grab it like so. We could just W get this I think and download it. So W get. There's limp is it does it work? Yep. All right, and then we'll host our own basic Python web server. What we're doing here is we're saying, hey, Python, we want to use a module from you, the HTTP server module, and we want to host a basic web server on port 80 so that we can transfer files to our victim. So here is our victim, and now we'll do wget. We'll type an RIP of 10.13.46.224, limps.sh, and we'll be able to download that file now to our victim machine. If we lsla, we should see our file right there. We want to make it executable like so, and then we can run linps.sh and see if we can find any interesting information here. So you can see what it's doing. It says, hey, here are some things we're gonna check. If you see red, yellow, there's a 95% of a privilege escalation vector. Red, we should take a look to it. Light cyan is just users with the council. Blue is users without a council and mounted devs. Green is common things. And light magne ma magenta is our username. So we'll see if this discovers anything interesting. What is up, DJB sec? Good to have you here. So if you do this enough, you'll notice things that are often false positives. Like I doubt we're going to be abusing the pseudo version. So we can scroll, 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 scroll. Nothing interesting here. There's AWS information. This would be helpful on a real pen test, but not helpful on a try hacking machine. It is in AWS, so you'll see that in every try hacking machine. And you can exploit this every once in a while. People tell me, oh, they're all vulnerable. These are technically AWS credentials, but they're not attached to a role, so they can't be exploited. Trust me, I tried to hack try hack me with these AWS creds and I was unsuccessful. <laughs> That's how I know they don't work. Look through here, see if there's anything that just stands out to us. Grab a drink of water. Nothing super interesting yet. It's interesting it's listening on 25, but don't know if that'll be super helpful. We have our users, the council, root, and think. So right now we're trying to get into the think uh, user so we can get the user flag because although we have a reverse shell, we still don't have the user flag. We need to grab thinks uh, credentials. So far, nothing is really standing out to me. Oh, this is interesting. We have a dot git directory in op slash dev. That is um, definitely unusual. So let's drop that in our notes. Uh, dot git directory might be interesting. We'll drop that there. Trevor Smith said, just got power internet back from the hurricane. Happy to be here. Crazy. And hey, I'm happy to have you here. Thank you. Thank you for being here. And yeah, glad you're okay. Craziness. Really nothing else interesting here. Our capabilities all look fine. Looking for passwords, it's not finding anything with its searches. All right, well, let's go to this right here, opt dev git. So CD opt dev, we have that. Can I do git um, log uh, CD dot git? Okay, how about LSLA? So in Git, dot .git is often for GitHub development and pushing changes that way. So this might be the application is talking about. And there's a few interesting files here. One thing that's always interesting is anytime you see a config, it's worth looking at. So let's go ahead and look at the config. And would you look at that? We have some credentials right there for the Think user from GitHub. So let's go ahead and grab that and add that to our notes. Right, we got those there. 
And so let's try those out. We'll just close our web server and let's try to SSH as this think user at pirate.thm. We'll say yes, jump over to this and grab our thinking pirate. Fingers crossed and we have access. Okay, <laughs> I can't type that. ID, we're not in the interesting groups. Can we sudo L, type in his password, and we can't run anything. But what we can do is get the user flag. But I am going to see if that pops up one second. And yep, we are able to get the user flag, but I am not going to give you the flag. I want you to do this yourself. So if you're to this point, you just have to cat user.txt and it will give you the user flag and you can drop that into the try hacking machine right here is where that user flag is going to go. But I'm not going to give you the flag. You can't harvest the flag for my video. I'm showing you how to do all of it, but you need to do it yourself to get that flag. How realistic is it to pull an LLMNR man in the middle test in a company? It is realistic. It all depends on how things are set up. It's going to work better if you're on-prem and you're able to do it right away in the morning, but it's definitely realistic. Yeah. All right, anyways, we have this, and if we look back at our notes, remember the description we were given. So we, we got this done, right? We can cross that out. We have that part of our roadmap done. And then we said post exploitation uncover credentials in a directory. We saw that in the description and we did that. We were able to find those credentials in that directory. And then it says enumerate an older version of the application. Well, like I was saying before, applications are often developed with Git as a repository or GitHub as a repository and using Git for version control. So let's go back over to that Git repository or rather dot Git uh, directory and see what interesting information might be there. So it's op dev .git. So we'll cd to opt if I can type. And here we are. If I do git, I think it's git log. Okay, it is. So when we have access to a dot git, we can do git log and see all of the different commits that were created. These are commits that show changes made to an application. And it says here, we have a comment that they added a shell endpoint and we have this commit ID right there. If we want to see what they actually did, I think the syntax is git show. And then we can grab this commit ID and copy in the commit ID like so. And we have some information here. Let me look at chat, make sure I'm not missing anything. Yeah, we have like Team SC in the building. That's amazing. Thank you everyone for stopping by, showing your support, hanging out with me. Hopefully you have your black hoodie on. Mr. Diesel Dog said, hey Tyler or chat, anyone know any good resources to learn the blue team side of things? Uh, TCM Security just released a certification on a junior SOC analyst. I think that'd be a really good place to start. The course for that is taught by my good friend, uh, Andrew Prince, aka Malwarecube, is that, I think that's his YouTube name, his handle. But that would be a really good place to start. Also, the Try Hack Me platform has SOC Level One and SOC Level Two pass that will give you a really good introduction to some of the Blue Team stuff. So that's what I would recommend. Let me know in chat what you guys think about that. But all right, let's check out this code and see if we can understand what is going on. It's also, it's pirate.py.old, which fits into our hint. Remember it says, enumerate an older version of the application. So we'll say that. And we'll see if we can understand what is going on here, but I think, hey, we did this much of it based on the description. So we are defining a function called switch case and we're doing client socket data. So very basic way of sending data to a port, which was kind of what we saw when we hit port 8,000, but it says if data equals some endpoint, get this endpoint typo there, client socket else, check socket is admin and downgrade if it is not approved. Check socket is admin and downgrade if is not improved. If, if, okay, so it, 
it seems like it's taking data and seeing if it's coming from an admin. And when it's not an admin, it's not going to run it as root. It's going to run it as WW data, which is the reason when we got a reverse shell right here, we got the reverse shell as uh, WW data instead of like the root user. Whoops. Oh, let me go back to my notes. That's where I was looking at. Okay. And then it's going to spawn. So if we type shell, it will just give us a shell. Let's actually try that. Oh, oh, here's my SSH. We'll just type that as SSH. We can close this out. We don't need that anymore. We can also close this out. We don't need that anymore. But I think if I'm reading the code right, if we do this and just type shell, yeah, there we go. It gives us a shell, but you can see we are not a shell as www or we're not a shell as root, we're a shell as www data, which you already have access to, that's not gonna help us. But if we are understanding this code correctly, it's looking for a specific endpoint. So if we send a specific endpoint to data, so for example, this is the data, Whoop, let me exit out of here. When we do this initial connection, this, this is the data that we're sending, right? So hello test.txt. That's the data that is ascending. So we need to fuzz that and see if we can find the keyword that it is looking for. Now there's a few different ways we could do this, but I think we should make a custom Python script. And do I have code on here? I don't. I prefer Visual Studio Code just because I like it. So let's go ahead and get Visual Studio Code installed. And we have, of course, on Linux the greatest operating system around. And we have 15 seconds left, just enough time for a drink of water from all my talking. <clears throat> all right, eight, five, four, three, two, one. Blast off, all right. CD, we'll go over to my downloads. If I could do my home, oh my goodness, I can't type. And we'll do sudo dpkg i, and this is it code? Yeah, there we go. We'll go ahead and install Visual Studio Code. What's TCM? TCM is TCM Security. They have the Academy. Since we're having questions on that, this is TCM Academy. Y'all need to check it out. It's incredible. And they just opened a free tier. They also have a bunch of free content on YouTube. So even without a sub, there is some incredible content here. I will drop a link to this in the chat. Oh, this is my, my Academy account, but I dropped a link to that in the chat for you guys. Tyler, you're saying Linux is the best because of Bieber Linux. What the heck is Bieber Linux, bro? Ha! <laughs> No, I'm saying it's the best because of Hannah Montana Linux, not Bieber Linux. This, <laughs> guys, I think when I hit like 50,000 subscribers, we should do an entire Try Hack Me or Hack the Box machine on the Hannah Montana Linux distribution. Like do our entire, our entire like pen testing on this Linux distro would be amazing. So 50,000 subs, we're gonna do it. We're gonna launch up Hannah Montana and we're gonna, we're gonna pwn some machines with the Hannah Montana distro, but all right, let's say yes. All right, cool. We have it installed. Let's go back over to home. Tyler, try hack me. Pirate. And we'll do code right here. Yes, I trust myself. We'll do dark. That's fine. And let's create a new folder and we'll just call this, I don't know, um, fuzzing.py, shall we? So what do we need to do with this? Let's try to think this out. If we go over to our notes, here is what we need our application to do. We need it to send a request to pyrat.thm8000 and we need to have it loop through a list of possible parameters and then basically tell us if the parameter is correct. 
right? Easy enough. So we need to send a request, loop through a list of possible parameters and tell us if the parameter is correct. So when it comes to Python, there's something called Python libraries that we work with to make things a lot easier. Do you want to install the Python extension? Yeah, let's install it. We can begin doing this. Let me see if I can zoom in. Okay, that's too much. Can I zoom in like, I want to make sure you guys can see it, but put that to the side. I feel like I zoomed in wrong. Can I just make the text bigger, maybe? Here. Is it maybe view, appearance? Oh, well, maybe just zoom in is what I can do. All right, we'll just zoom in, fine. So you guys can see it okay. Now, you saw this. If we look back at our code right here, we're using Socket, which is actually a library in order to send TCP requests and any type of like traffic in that way. So we'll want to go ahead and import that library. So we can do import Socket like so. So that means, hey, now we have access to everything in the Socket library. We can see all good. Okay, sweet. I'll try to keep my eye on the chat. Let me know if anyone has an issue um, seeing this and I'll try to make it a little bit bigger for us. But now we have this, we can go ahead and define our host because we know what host we need to hit. So let's just do host, actually we'll do lowercase. And our host is of course pirate.thm. We could also put the IP in there and our port is gonna be 8,000 because we know we wanna send it to pirate.thm and we wanna send it to that port. Now we can also uh, define our word list, right? If we're thinking of word list. And we could even add some comments in our code. So we'll say like setting up the target, setting up the word list for fuzzing. And now there's a bunch of different word lists we could use for something like this. We just want a word list that has a bunch of names in it, I think would be sufficient. So we can use like user share word lists. I'm going completely off memory for the location of this, but user share word list, Durbuster directory list 2.3 medium dot text. That, that's it, right? Okay, I need to double check if my memory was correct on there. Haha, <laughs> yes. I did do it correct off memory. Freaking beautiful. So we have our word list set up for fuzzing, and now we want to set up the request to the endpoint, right? And we can define a function. A function in Python is just, hey, here's a little, almost like a little program within the program that takes an input, processes the input, and runs a command. So we wanna make a function, and we'll just call this function Right, we can call it like fuzz our endpoint. I think that fits. And we will want to take it from our word list up here. And we can even call this like our word list file to make it a little more clear. So our word list file. And we want to take in our function right here, we want to take input from our word list file like so. And then I think we have to do that. We can do a try. So, hey, try these things. And the first thing we want you to try, this will be to open our word list file. So this file up here, we need to open it and process it with Python. And so we can do, let's see. No, not a comment, there we go. With open word list file. And then we would wanna do R. I also think we need a comment here. R just means read it. If we don't do an R, it tries to write to it, which means it would try to overwrite our file. We don't want to write or add input into our directory list. We want to read from our directory list, and that's why we're doing the R there. So as file, like so. And now we want to loop through everything in this file. So if we look at this file, for example, You can see it's just a bunch of different input that you can usually use for directory brute forcing. Oh, waiting for part two of K2. Part two of K2 will drop on, I think I have it scheduled to drop on Friday, tomorrow. Yeah, part two of K2 drops tomorrow, I'm pretty sure. I think. Watch my YouTube channel. <laughs> You'll find out if it drops. But you can see, we want to go through each one of these and pull each uh, word down in there. So with this open as file, what we want to do is we'll say for line. Now, 
this right here can be anything. We could say for payload, for word, whatever it is. That doesn't matter. We're doing a for loop right here, but we'll say for line in file because we defined it as file up there. There's a few things that we want to do. One is we'll define another parameter and we'll call it our command because this is the data that we are going to send. And we want to go ahead and strip any white space, any new lines. Otherwise, when you send it, and I actually ran into this issue on another try hack me machine. Jeez, what machine was that? I think it was something with bypassing captcha and I was stuck for the longest time because I was doing exactly what I'm showing you right now, but I did not strip out the new lines at the end of my password list. And it was trying to send all my passwords with a, a forward slash N on the end as a new line and none of the passwords were working. I was like, what the heck is going on? Why is this not working? Because I forgot to do this. So with this, it's gonna open up our wordless file. All right, so try with open where this will open the file for line in file. And we can even add a comment here so we know what's going on. Clean up all the new lines and junk so I don't get mad. <laughs> There's my very um, in-depth commenting that I'm gonna do. So with our command here, now we need to actually make the connection to our pirate.thm on port 8000. So we'll say establish connection to the server right here. And what we can say is using the socket library, we actually saw this a little bit when we were looking at the code that we discovered in the dot git directory on the target machine. We can say with socket dot socket, this is just a standard um, Python syntax for this. I have to sneeze. All right, try not to sneeze into the microphone. With socket.socket .socket and socket.afinet, I believe you can even see it helping us out there. Once again, this is just typical Python stuff for making a request like this. And we can say as S, so this is gonna be the request we're sending out to make it a little bit simple or as our um, connection, essentially. We want to try to connect to it. And here's where we're gonna connect to our host and our port up above. So we'll do host port like so. And then what we need to do is send, send the fuzzing to the, I don't know, target host is what we can say, something like that. And we'll do S, so we wanna send that, send all, and we're gonna do command, uh, do I need to, no command encode, because we have to encode it as a byte, I believe. B, there are new lines. So what that's gonna do is if we don't include that, it's not gonna hit the enter key on the keyboard. So when we do it manually, let's do netcat pirate.thm8000, and I just type, for example, um, data, not, we need to have a new line. We need to have it hit enter so we can type in our next payload, right? Hit enter, next payload. And you can see payload is not defined, but that's what it's doing there with the new line. That's essentially hitting, hitting enter on our keyboard. So we're sending the command, but we also want to, you know, get the response. So receive, receive the response. And we'll just make this very simple. Define a parameter and we'll call it response. And we're going to receive it. Once again, very common syntax here. We want to decode it and strip any junk new lines, kind of like what you already saw me do. All right. So, so far we have that. We have our try clause, which should be good, but we have to figure out like, what does an invalid response contain? So an invalid response contains nothing, right? So like when I do data, the response literally contains no information. On the other hand, if I do something like payload, <clears throat> it says name payload is not defined, right? So we can add this, some logic to catch this, right? So we'll just say logic to catch valid responses, maybe would be a good comment. And we can say if the response, now in programming, the not equals is a 
exclamation mark and an equal. So we'll say if the response is not equal blank, because once again, if it's not a valid payload, the response is blank right there. So that's not going to help us. I've looked at the Python library pwn tools. I have, but I really haven't used it much um, because I don't usually do your typical cryptography fuzzing CTFs. This is one of the few times I've, I've done it. So I have heard of pwn tools and I know it's used for like buffer overflows and things like that, but I haven't personally um, messed around with it or used it. But here we go. If our response does not contain anything and if our response, and is not defined, that's what it says, right? Is not defined. And is not defined, is not in the response. I think those would be the two things, right? Blank and is not defined. If that's not in response, we can print Maybe we'll do an F string here and we can print like the response of the server. So if it responds like saying, I don't know, uh, enter a password or something. Oh, it makes this such thing much shorter. I'll have to check that out and, and see that and check out Pwn tools and see how much easier this makes it. But we can say, hey, if it doesn't contain those things, if it's not blank and doesn't contain is not defined, maybe its response is actually interesting to us and we can go ahead and print the response based on our fuzzing. All right. Now I think we can go back over to our try right here and we can say accept if we get like a file not found error which is a common thing. So if we try to fuzz with a payload that doesn't exist, we can print something like, bro, you're using a payload or you're using file that doesn't exist, homie. Right, that's exactly how a real developer would type that I'm pretty sure. And we can also do like an accept if there's a exception, we can catch it as an error and we'll pray F like dog and error occurred and here is your error. <laughs> All right, I think we can finally do it. So then we'll say, hey, just run the function, run the function and see what I all messed up because I am sure it was a lot like so. And then we'll do fuzz endpoint file <sighs> use the or operator of the and well let's see we'll see this probably won't work all right python 3 fuzzing I don't know if it's doing anything. <laughs> I should I should maybe add some print statements to this. We'll let it run. Oh, 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 it is doing something. We have another error. Okay, okay, stop. Response leading zeros in decimal integral literals are not permitted, to f f whatever. Um, okay, that's fine. Let's add that. So this is terrible code, but you know what? Freaking YOLO. <laughs> If it works, is it really terrible? I don't know. So, oh wait, if, if and is not defined is not in response <laughs> and uh, leading zeros not in, oh, why do I not have word wrap on? All right, if response is not equal anything and is not defined is not in response and leading zeros not in response. My code's terrible. I know. I know, guys. But now we stare at the screen. <laughs> you would not get your PR approved. Hey, it doesn't matter. Now I will say, guys, here is the big difference between programming 
and scripting. I am like barely a scripter. I'm mainly a script kitty, but I am not a programmer and I don't even try to play one on TV. Um, when it comes to ethical hacking, you don't need to know how to be a programmer, but it's helpful to know how to script. But when it comes to scripting, it's not necessarily about having the most uh, efficient code. It's just being able to make code that works and hopefully solves a problem you're trying to solve. Whether or not I did that here, I have no idea because it's uh, it doesn't seem like it's doing anything right now. What we could do is we can also bring in our handy tool, ChatGPT, and see where I messed up my code. Let me authenticate real quick to ChatGPT. All right, we have our robot friend. Oh, we got another response, invalid syntax. Well, I've only seen that once, so we'll ignore it. Let's ask GPT if there's anything wrong with my code. Um, how terrible is my code here? Hey, look. Okay, guys, I want... I want to, we'll just stop here. Your code looks pretty solid for a simple fuzzing script. We're going to ignore the that. We, he doesn't see any areas of improvement. Oh! But you guys know the issue? So, it's responding with password, which seems to be wanting a password. But you know what we didn't do? <laughs> we don't know what prompted that. We're printing the response, but we're not printing the payload that triggered the response. So we might want to add that, right? So we can say like um, command and we can just do a command like so. Whoops. And we'll run that again. Our <laughs> hallucinating. <laughs> He probably is. All right, let's see his areas of improvement. Let me break it down and offer suggestions to make it more efficient, readable, and reliable. Improvements. Currently, you're opening and closing a new socket connection for every single word in your word list. This can be incredibly slow, especially if your word list is large. Well, that would make sense while it takes forever. You should open the socket connection once and reuse it for each request rather than opening and closing it repeatedly. All right. Error handling. You've handled a file not found error, which is great. However, a better error message could be more information. You mean my error message of, bro, you're using a file that doesn't exist, homie, is not <laughs> good error message? Also, handling socket-related errors like socket timeout, connection refuse error, and socket whatever error can give you more robust error handling. Yeah, that's, that's for the real developers. Uh, magic strings. You're checking for specific strings like is not defined and leading zeros, but these should ideally be extracted out or parameterized for flexibility. You shut your mouth. I know you. I know it can be. <clears throat> Line cleanup. I like the so I don't get mad comment. Well, thank you. Thank you, ChatGPT. I'm glad you like it. It's a good habit to clean the input. However, if your word list includes empty lines or comments, you might want to filter those out before sending them. I don't, oh, my, my word list that I'm actually sending. Okay, so we can we can see that this is working. Remember we, oh, look at that. We can see that for the invalid syntax, it was the command N. For that one, it's global. And when it asks for the password, it is the command admin. Ha, 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 ha. Make fun of my scripting skills all you want. But... It looks like my scripting skills worked. If we do this and type admin, it's going to prompt us for the password. And we'll just say like, hello. And then it just keeps prompting for our password. <sighs> okay, back to our notes. What have we done so far? Create a custom script and discover an endpoint. Boom, we did it. The endpoint of admin. And remember, if we can get that password based on the logic of the, the application that we found, we'll be able to run it as root. So now 
we need to do a similar um, command right here, but I, I'll, I'll go through the whole thing again because I recognize it's a little bit confusing as we're making these Python scripts, but we want to do something similar again, but instead of doing what we did of finding the endpoint, we're going to try to fuzz for the password. So let's go ahead and make another file and we'll just call this password.py maybe. And we can follow kind of similar syntax here, but we can close our fuzzy one right there. We'll do the same thing, import socket. And I think we'll also want to import sys for system. And similar to before, let's set our host. Our host is pirate.thm. And speaking of our host, I need to make sure our machine's not going to expire. We'll add one hour. If I'm not done in an hour and 56 minutes, I'm going to quit. So we have our host there. We are going to give our port of 8,000 like so. And now we will, oh, we need a word list as well, right? Um, so we can call this our password word list. And we can use the classic user share word list rock you dot text. Common thing for CTF. So we set up our host, we set up our word list, and now we can start making another very beautiful Tyler function. So define fuzz passwords. We'll accept the password word list that we set up. And now we can go ahead and make this. And we'll do try and accept a little bit. So um, ChatGPT is happy with us trying to catch our error messages. So we'll do try right here. And what exactly do we want it to try? Well, same thing as before. So we'll say with open our password word list from before we want to read it. We don't want to write to it and we'll save it as file, just like what we did in our previous um, command, previous file that we were working with. All of this up to this point is very much um, the same thing. And then we'll do that loop again. So here we can put anything we want here, but for readability and so chat GPT compliments me again, we'll make it a little more understandable. So we'll say we're going to do a for loop. So for password, which means it's going to take every single password on this line and try to do this. So we'll say for password in file, right? Because we're saving that as a file. So for password in file, let's go ahead and clean it up again. Yo, as for our chat GPT friend, he told me to make you know, better comments. And I think I think that right there is a much better comment than my previous comments in my previous script. Um, hey, Kimberly can fix it. Just became a member on YouTube. I don't have sound effects. Welcome to the party, pal. John V said, add me on LinkedIn. Bro, I have 2,000 requests on LinkedIn right now. You need to DM me on Discord and tell me your LinkedIn name if you want me to add you on LinkedIn. I tried to use JavaScript to just accept everyone and LinkedIn got mad at me and rate limited me and like temporarily banned me from the website. So I'm not going through 2000 plus requests to accept everybody. So if you want to add me on LinkedIn, discord me your um, LinkedIn name, and then I will, I will add you that way. So anyways, we're going to clean up our password. So we'll say our password, the same thing before we want to run the strip function on it, strip all the new lines and all of that craziness. And we can say establish our connection to the server, please. Now, if we say it nicely, it might accept our connection a little bit better. And this is same commands that we ran before. Really nothing new here. We're going to say with socket dot socket socket a, uh, I think it's dot actually, a f i net. You can actually see it right there. I net and we'll do socket dot sock stream to set up our connection. We'll do as S again, just because it's easy to send our connection. And we'll do the same thing that we did before. We'll do an S connect. And remember we did our host, what? Oh, that's just an error. Wait, did I add a breakpoint or something? No, don't do a breakpoint. I don't even know how I did that. All right, our host import, not not a breakpoint. We don't, we don't want a breakpoint. So, okay. We're opening up our password file. We're cleaning up our password. We have established our connection to the server. And now we want to send admin, right? Because that's that's the first thing that we need to send is them. I just bit my tongue. We need to send admin because when we send admin, then it prompts for the password. So we'll say send the admin command so we can prompt for password. 
like so, and we'll do s send all, send as a byte, admin, and we'll remember we have to do that new line at the end because if we don't do that, it won't hit enter. So it's gonna do admin and click enter essentially on the keyboard because then it will prompt for the password, right? And then we need to receive the password prompt slash response, right? Should just be the password prompt, not the response. I mean, it is technically the response, but it should just ask us like, hey, enter the password, but we need to um, receive that and process it. So we'll just say response here, set a new variable called response, and we will receive it same as what we did kind of in our previous script, same as we did in our previous script, clean up any new lines and things like that as we receive the response. Whoa, congratulations, OP Kevin. Today I reached 400 streaks day-to-day -day learning each day in THM. That's amazing, congratulations. Definitely not, Chad said, is this a brute force attack? It is a brute force attack, you are right. I mean, kind of. I think technically it'd be considered a password spraying attack because brute force is when you iterate through every single possible letter combination. We are taking a list of passwords and spraying it at the application. So kind of brute force, kind of password spraying, depends how you want to define it. But okay, receive the password prompt. And it should be, it should have password in it, right? But in case it doesn't, we might want to catch that. We, we don't want to run our next command if it doesn't say password or if I screw something up. So we'll do like if password is in the response and we'll just lowercase it so that we're not trying to see if it's uppercase or lowercase. I'm pretty sure it's just lowercase though. We'll do response.lower. Right, we're checking if it asks for a password. And if it does ask for a password, this is where we wanna send all of our passwords from rocku.txt into the application. So we'll say s send all. I think we'll do double quotes like so. Send all password. Yes, okay, yeah, password, right? Because with open password file, for password in file, password stripped. So yes, we are sending the password here. And then we also need to go ahead and send a new line because remember that's kind of the entering that we are doing here, dot encode. Hold up, did my parentheses correct here? So send the password followed by a new line, essentially to hit enter, encode it so it sends it as a byte because that's how it needs to receive it. Otherwise, I think it will error out. Okay. I think that's correct. Receive the response after entering the password. Start for decode and then strip again, just to get rid of all the new line. <sighs> okay, I need to look at my code. With us, oh, so we're opening the file, we're cleaning it up, we're establishing our connection to the host in the port. We're gonna send the admin data. So admin data right there. We're gonna send the admin data followed by a new line. We're gonna receive the password prompt. If password is in the response, then we're gonna send our, our passwords up above, and then we're gonna receive the response back. And then if the password is wrong, it just asks for um, password again, right? So. check if the password is correct or if if it's still asking for a password like that and we'll do my ghetto code before if password in response lower than right continue so like just keep doing what you're doing continue else we can print like, congrats, lead hacker. Right? Congrats, lead hacker. The password is 
password and then we can break because we are we are done with it, right? All right, I need to get my go back to my 4. I think right there. So we have all that done else if we don't get the password prompt, right? We can print You suck, no password prompt received. I think that fits the descriptive taste that ChatGPT wants me to do in my code. I think I think that will help. And then we can also say, oops, print you suck, no password found and break. And our try clause starts right there. So we need to close that out with some accept so we can do the same thing we did before. File not found error. We can do this, print lol. Use a real file, noob, just like that. And what was our other except that we did? I don't even remember. Yeah, we'll just do that same thing. Whoops. Exception as E, dog and error occurred. I'll say. YOLO run it, fuzz password, yeah, password wordless, thank you, because I couldn't remember what it was called. And I defined that up there, right, password wordless. Save it, cross our fingers, wait for everything to break. <laughs> yep, all right. Line 26, we have a error if password in response lower. All right. If password in response lower. Silly Tyler. Okay, let's see if that fixes it. Break outside of loop. Good job, Tyler. Oh, whoops. else print oh yeah it is outside of it. can I just delete? I don't need that all right you guys think anything's gonna happen do you see that Congrats, Leet Hackster. The password is ABC123. All right, let's clear this up. Let's give this a shot. Admin, ABC123. Boom. And you can cat root.txt, but I'm not going to give you the flag. I want you to do it yourself. Follow along, get hands on keyboard, and you'll be able to get the root flag yourself. But we have now solved the Pirate machine. We were able to get the user flag and the root flag. And in the process, you can see everything that we did. We did that. We fuzzed passwords. We can go ahead and um, mark that out. And we have our fuzzing application. We should probably include our scripts here. So let's do like our script for fuzzing the endpoint. And that was this first fuzzing script. Just in case like Microsoft or someone wants to buy my scripts from me to, you know, just stand in awe of my incredible programming skills. And we'll say script for password sprain. And we'll grab our other one like so. dog and okay beautiful and we successfully solved the machine made some custom scripts so quite quite a fun machine hope you enjoyed it as well hope you learned something in the process and once again for those of you watching the standalone video afterwards if you have a question about something i did something that didn't make sense to you let me know in the comments of this video i really do read the comments and i'll do my best to get back to you and see what i can do to help you or explain something a little more fully but hey thank you all for watching i will catch you guys in the next one